So for those who don't know me, uh, my name is Megan Latshaw, and I am part of the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. I work in the Department of Environmental Health and Engineering, and I uh, co-lead this focus area of the Bloomberg American Health Initiative with Kirsten Kohler. We call it the Environmental Challenges Focus Area. And so I'm very excited to be here today to see all of these amazing people in the room um, and very grateful for your time. So I was tasked with, I probably tasked myself with this because nobody else wanted to do it, um, pulling together all of the notes that you guys took from the round tables. And so I felt very rude during the last session because I was buried in my computer doing that. And um, what I came up with, uh, I'll have to tell you from the very beginning that it might look like I left out frontline health. I did not. I felt like that went across all of these areas. And so it's incorporated into my five short slides, although Kirsten told me I should take at least one bullet off every slide. Um, originally, each round table had three slides, so I crammed it down into one for each area. So there were two transportation groups, and what I saw as some of the common themes that came out of those groups were education. Especially one group highlighted that we need to educate the next generation of environmental health leaders on the historical context of environmental injustice in order to tackle current issues, that we need to understand what has happened to communities in the past in order to be able to handle what they're dealing, or work with them on what they're dealing with now. A second topic that came up, I think actually in both groups, was communication, and the need to increase communication skills so that future leaders can talk not only to the public, um, but, and actually this was a common theme throughout, but also to policymakers, to practitioners. Um, in general, we need to communicate a lot better. Community engaged research, and this touches upon the first bullet. The recommendation was to develop research tools to help citizen scientists, we keep hearing that again and again, to be able to measure exposures and health outcomes. They talked about data availability, access, and transparency. At the, they wanted local data, at the zip code level preferably, accessible data that the public can easily access, and aggregate data on public health, transportation, land use, and socioeconomic status. They, one of the groups said, we really need a vision for healthy transportation. What is it we're working toward? What's the vision for the future? Sort of like Elon Musk, like, we have to know what we, where we want to get in order to make decisions that are going to get us there. And lastly, policies. One group mentioned that the private development model is wholly divorced from the public health data. And so how do we connect those two areas? And how do we force interagency collaboration when it comes to transportation and public health? Anybody from the transportation groups want to add anything? Did I miss anything important? All right. At the very end, uh, we can talk about all of this. So air pollution is next. The first, one of the groups said that we need uh, cost-benefit analysis. And in cost-benefit analyses, we need to be in more inclusive. We often tend to focus on mortality. Who died? Well, we need to look at other health impacts besides that. And also costs. Public health is not very good on the economic or the cost side of things, and we need to be better about that. And lastly, we need to look at greenhouse gases as, uh, as part of air pollution, just as EPA does. And again, here's communications. You'll see at the very end, I sort of pull together what are the common themes across all of these areas. In the air pollution group, the communications needs um, highlighted again, we need to talk to all of the public at all levels, and we need it to better engage citizen scientists. The air pollution group, one of them brought up diversity in decision making. So not only do we need to reach out and engage members of communities, however you want to define that, um, they said especially disadvantaged communities, but also industry, city and local governments, and the healthcare profession. 
again, th the idea that we need local data at the zip code level came up with the, this group as well. They also said we need better source attribution data. Where is the air pollution coming from? We, they said we need better data visualization tools and also tools for scaling the data in order to make it defensible. They pointed out that we need um, better, we need to be able to better talk about economic impacts. So looking at loss of productivity, disease exacerbation, welfare, disability adjusted life years. We told folks don't use jargon um, when we gave our speakers directions and um, I didn't follow my directions myself, I apologize. Daly's is disability li uh, adjusted life years. <laughs> Oh boy. Um, and then f the last bullet for air pollution is citizen science. And a lot of these you can tell cut across all of these bullets, but in particular when it came to air pollution, there was a call for employing low cost, simple and local sensor devices to empower the public. Devices with a C, not an S. Anybody in the air pollution groups want to shout out anything that I left out when I tried to condense all your amazing talking points. Yeah, Cliff, of course. Um, so I, I would say you missed something in not including the frontline public health, because while I don't disagree with any of the things that you have up there, there does seem to be a sort of a top-down direction to this, which is we're training leaders to talk to the public, mm -hmm. or we need to better communicate the science mm -hmm. to the public. Um, and I'm really not sure that that's the experience of those of us in frontline public health who have been told all over and over and over again, which is what you need to do is go in and listen first and figure out what the questions are. And you may be asking the wrong questions. And so I, I don't think you've really captured that in these three slides. Mm -hmm. um, absolutely. And I think that top down, bottom up is coming, Cliff. Um, I'm sure you'll hold my feet to the fire if you don't see it. So I was asked to repeat the question since you don't have a microphone. Um, and, or the comment, I guess, the comment is that uh, we should not have incorporated the frontline health uh, slide into the other slides, that we should have had a standalone, in particular because a lot of what I've presented so far is, seems very top down, seems very much about we are communicating to the public rather than listening to the public about what their concerns are and what their values are and what questions they have. And that is uh, incredibly important and it's something that I think the entire field really does need to shift towards. So I agree wholeheartedly with you, Clef. I think it's gonna be captured later, we'll see. <laughs> but I, I just want to reinforce what was just said. Yeah. That was something we, I think our group really looked at uh, more a solutions orientation rather than description of things from the top down. Mm -hmm. Is how do we get there working from the bottom up? Yeah. And and you know working at the community level mm -hmm. and then all the way to the top absolutely. and asking the right questions, et cetera, is is absolutely critical. Great. Thanks, Dan. So then the other uh, two tables focused on planning, and I think both groups talked about data, gaps in data. Um, one group in particular said there's gaps in exposure according to characteristics of the environment, like is it urban, is it rural, what are the demographics, what are the vulnerabilities? One group noted uh, that public health expertise has not really been involved in local planning to a great extent. So they saw that as an opportunity for us to get more involved, be more active. Oh, here's some top down, bottom up. I did get in there somewhere. Um, and then also partnerships. So not just top down, but bottom up. Um, and engaging not just community, well, engaging general community members, not just advocates. Um, and also engaging with business. One of the groups talked about community-based participatory research. 
and its importance. And I think, again, that gets to the idea of, of uh, being bottom up, not top down. Another mentioned education and how we need to target elementary schools as well as high school, college, and even graduate level, in particular focus on decision science. Somebody suggested an incentive reward structure. They said that might help overcome challenges to support authentic local collaboration and innovation. So how do we reward people for being innovative? If it's not written into their job description, what's going to give them incentive to do things like this? And it's uh, one group said we really need to fully support, public health needs to fully support things like economic development, healthy housing, and of course education. Again, with the communications, we need to communicate in particular these folks noticed, noted with people in other sectors. Speaking of other sectors, energy um, is the next one. Anybody have anything on planning that I missed when I was summarizing your notes? Yeah, Howie. You got it coming from all directions. Thanks, Megan, that was great. Not really something that was missed, but just a comment. You're calling this category planning, which sounds like that thing that planners do, mm -hmm. but a lot of the spirit of our conversation would have fit better if the title had been the built environment or community mm -hmm. design or mm -hmm. something like that. It, it's, we take it, it's about housing, it's about sidewalks, it's about streets and so on. Yeah. And often those things aren't the work of planners, mm -hmm. they're the work of other parties. So just a kind of a, a suggestion that you might think what this category is called so that it best captures what you mean to capture with it. That's a great suggestion. We had, um, because we, were, we, we went back and forth on a lot of the names of these groups, and, and yes, planning is not ideal. Um, so we had descriptions at the top of each um, category trying to explain what we meant. And we mean also healthy housing when we talk about planning. And so you're right, built environment might be a better, a better term, or healthy community design. So energy, we heard from one group that we needed political solutions, like a carbon tax. And then we heard from the second energy group that how do we get the Bloomberg Sustainability Accounting Standards Board to include health as a material benefit when they're looking at investment options? So that was a very specific policy, both two very specific policy goals. The groups both noted that we needed better tools, uh, in particular to measure the public health impacts of energy decisions, and also to measure the public health of value of switching to cleaner energy sources. Um, and we needed tools to better estimate that value and communicate it. Um, we, they identified the idea that we should better measure the impact of energy on PM 2.5 exposures, including, so how does urban design impact PM 2.5? How does transportation impact that? How does housing density impact that? So that was more of a data gap. Again, we heard about partnerships and how important it is to start conversations with communities and non-health partners early to ask them what are your questions, what are your concerns, what are your values. So that comes back to the bottom-up idea. And of course, there's always data gaps. The, the energy, one of the energy groups says there's two types of data gaps. One is core data needs to be accessible to local communities. And the second is high-level data is needed to address global questions. They highlighted the importance of storytelling. And so I put that under education. We need to better educate people, create better storytellers in order to mobilize communities, influencers, and decision makers. And then, of course, once again, communications. We need, the recommendation for energy was that we can actually have a lot of opportunities here because we can frame energy in economic ways. We can say energy is money. It's efficient. It's, it creates energy independence. And those resonate with the people that Jerry Taylor was talking about at lunch who might not share our, the same values that we do in making the world a healthier place. They might be more interested in energy independence. So my last slide, oh, before I do last slide, anybody in the energy groups, did I miss anything huge that you want to make sure gets out there? Or general comments? So, oops, so you have one in the back. Uh, 
Hi, um, Tamara Tolzel, Laughlin, Maryland Environmental Health Network. Um, we just talked a lot, like it, it might be underscored by the fact that transportation is a subsection of PM 2.5. We talked a lot about how energy infrastructure generally and transportation infrastructure are big, are going to be places where there are big data, data gaps and where we're going to need tools to be able to talk to lots of different people. So in thinking about those, those are the two buckets that that people who are out doing applied work would say is, a, is the space where, while there might be a lot of data sets, that stuff's not getting out of the, out of the uh, um, conference circuit. Great, so again, with data accessibility is important. So I tried to pull together, as I was going through this, the common themes that I noticed. Um, this was just in the short time I had between the roundtables and um, now, but I'm sure we'll go back and we'll do this later as well. But the common themes I identified were that we need to actively increase partnerships, including with the business community. And we need it to show economic impacts as well as public health impacts. We need to incorporate equity and justice into everything. And we need to engage impacted, the impacted community early, considering their values and their history. We need to develop tools for citizen scientists. And we need to increase data availability and accessibility, especially to the public, at the local level, everybody wants local data and tools to help us analyze it, whether it's visualization tools or mapping tools. And then lastly, we need to better communicate at all levels of the public, at all ages and across all sectors. So that was my summary. Any questions or general comments? I'm out of time, so. Great, thank you, Megan, for that quick turnaround. <clears throat> So, so thanks again. I know that turning around outcomes from a discussion like that is a, a challenge. So thank you, Megan, for that synthesis. And um, we are going to turn now to the last panel for the day. Um, so if I can have those folks come up. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Kelly McIntyre. I am the physical activity coordinator for Get Healthy Philly, which is the Division of Chronic Disease Prevention at the Philadelphia Department of Public Health. Also, I'm proud to be uh, one of the inaugural members of the, uh, sorry, a member of the inaugural class of Bloomberg Fellows, um, and really excited to moderate this panel on innovations for transforming uh, environmental health. Uh, in this session, we'll look, talk to talk to each other about successes uh, in environmental challenges. So that should be really exciting. Before I follow in the brilliant footsteps of my predecessor, Dr. Brees, by reading all of the bios of our panelists, I want to invite you all, when we bring our panelists to the front, and perhaps later in the session, or later in the day, or whenever you feel compelled to clap for someone, that we, uh, do what we call it, Get Healthy Philly, active applause. So that means when you feel compelled to clap, you're just gonna stand up. I think everybody could use a little bit of increased circulation and as the sedentary sheriff in town, we're gonna make sure you guys get up and get moving, okay? So let me first uh, read the bios of our um, amazing four presenters. So first, Tom Matei is the Vice President for Environmental Health at Vital Strategies. With more than 25 years of experience in environmental epidemiology, environmental health practice, and policy development at the national and local level. His work at Vital Strategies focuses on household and ambient air pollution and promoting healthy and sustainable cities. After Mr. Matei, we will hear from um, Ben Hobbs. Ben Hobbs is, is the Theodore M. and K.W. Shad Chair of the Environmental Management at Johns Hopkins, Univers John Hopkins University Department of Environmental Health and Engineering and the Director of the Hopkins Environment, S Energy, Sustainability, and Health Institute. That's a mouthful. <laughs> His research applies systems analysis and economics to electricity policy, planning, and operations, as well as to ecological restoration and water resources management. 
After that, we'll hear from Dan Costa, an adjunct professor at the University of North Carolina Gilling School of Global Public Health. He's recently retired from the US EPA, having served as the National Program Director for the Air, Climate, and Energy Research Program in the Office of Research and Development. He is particularly interested in understanding human health impacts of air pollution. Um, including how pollutants affect the body's heart and lung health. And after that, we actually have a slight change to our agenda. We have um, Dr. Pollock is going to come and speak to us again because unfortunately, Leslie Meehan from the Tennessee Department of Health can't be with us today. So we'll hear again from Dr. Pollock and then we'll hear a great conversation. And now we'll practice our active applause. <laughs> Great. Well, um, it's really fun to be here. I've really so enjoyed the conversations and the presentations so far today. It's one of the great things about environmental health is that it touches on so many different aspects of uh, cities, where, which I care about a lot, and, and about uh, people and intersections of things. So I'm going to try to uh, cover in just a 10-minute period um, several years of experience working on New York City's sustainability planning process. I'm gonna focus on our air pollution work as a point of departure, but then talk about how we broadened out our engagement in the city's sustainability planning. And then I'll finish up by talking about some of the success factors that um, uh, emerged on reflection of uh, what, what went well, what didn't go so well, and also some challenges that we uh, face. So in 2007, the city launched its first long-term sustainability plan. It really emerged from a realization by the city planning department that the city had a lot of undeveloped real estate and was uh, growing in population. And it was estimated at that time that about a million more people might be moving to New York City or living in New York City by 2030. So this economic development and population uh, accommodation plan, let's say, developed into a comprehensive sustainability plan. Fairly late in the process, the um, City Health Department, and that acronym NYC DOHMH stands for our somewhat clunky name, the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. Um, we were engaged fairly late in the process and we were charged with developing a neighborhood air monitoring program. Um, so as you can see from the uh, inside cover of the first Plan YC uh, report, which was released in 2007, there were a number of other areas that were not listed as under air quality, but they were relevant to air quality. Um, the sustainability planning process in New York City is now uh, enshrined in city law. There is an Office of Long-Term Planning and Sustainability the city has to have an updated plan every four years. The brand name changed with the uh, uh, de Blasio administration from Plan YC to One NYC, which added an equity lens. Um, our role as a health department expanded over time to include things like climate action, health equity, and other aspects of public health that are affected by the city's um, uh, physical and social environment and a range of other policies. Uh, one thing that's important to keep in mind about New York City, it's probably true of any large city, we're really a city of neighborhoods. The physical environment, uh, if you visited New York City and you visited Midtown Manhattan or the theater district, we have a wide range of physical environments, very suburban uh, neighborhoods in the outer boroughs, and then we have some of the densest uh, communities in, in the country. There are stark economic disparities. Some of them are uh, demarcated by a single street, um, 
like 96th Street on the uh, east side of Manhattan. And then we have a lot of uh, community local concerns. Uh, just as an example, uh, there's, there was a lot of controversy for many years about a waste, solid waste management plan that brought a um, waste transfer station to a very affluent community on the Upper East Side, uh, concerns about the airport and so forth. And many times these community concerns are well grounded in data and sometimes they're, uh, they're grounded on just uh, beliefs or perceptions. So uh, partly motivated by that context, which is we have a city where uh, like every other large city, we have an air monitoring program that is, uh, conforms with EPA requirements. It's managed by the State Department of Environmental Conservation. Uh, but it's a, a methodology for monitoring air quality that's not really designed to capture neighborhood scale variation in air pollution in a very um, uh, complex and variable physical environment like we have in New York. So we were charged with designing an air pollution monitoring program to capture at neighborhood scale the common uh, important pollutants for public health, like PM 2.5, to design it in a way that we could identify local sources that were influencing the spatial variation in air pollution within New York City. We were not charged with doing research by the city uh, sustainability plan, but we knew that the data that we would collect would be useful to generate exposure estimates for research. And then uh, we also, over time, realized that we had this infrastructure that could be used to measure other things. We added an epidemiology component, which included uh, the capability to do health impact assessment. And then we partnered with the academic community in New York to do original research. Um, the, the important uh, thing about our air pollution program is that it was designed from the beginning to inform local air quality management. And we used that information to also develop information that we thought was relevant to the city's climate action plan. So uh, to sum up a long story, we, after several years of work, we had collected data that showed that, uh, as in much of the world, household energy is an important source of ambient pollution. So in New York City, that means in big buildings, we were using a lot of high sulfur heating oil. And that was a big contributor to neighborhood air pollution. That led to actions at the local, state, and state level. And we were able to demonstrate a 70% reduction in sulfur dioxide levels in five years. Using our health impact assessment methodology, we were able to estimate that improved air quality in New York City was preventing a large number of deaths and hospital admissions. And this was announced by our mayor, our health commissioner, and. Uh, the head of the city sustainability office in 2013. So how did we organize ourselves to do this sort of work? Um, we had a, uh, a team with specialists in epidemiology, environmental health, GIS. We worked with academic partners, as I said. Some of those partners worked in an organization called the New York City Panel on Climate Change. And this team integrated data from a wide range of sources. Some of it was relevant to air pollution. Some of it was data that uh, was relevant to other kinds of projects that we worked on. We uh, organized to serve internal programs, including food safety, veterinary pest control, so that our data analytic capabilities were used to improve uh, program effectiveness and to report to the public. And then we developed with support from CDC, sorry, the, uh, an environmental and health data portal, which was, became sort of a lightweight publishing platform where data that we were generating could be uh, put in the portal, could be accessed by communities uh, to understand conditions in their neighborhoods. And we used funding from federal government, from the sustainability plan. We had a climate and health program. We um, used city tax levy funds to fund some of our work, and then we had research grants. So I'm just going to skip ahead here in the interest of time. Um, what, what, what can we say about the experience that we had in New York? What worked well and what were some challenges that we uh, were not entirely successful in overcoming? One thing that was really important, we had very strong political leadership in Mayor Bloomberg. And he got the agencies together around this planning process. So 
uh, for the health department, it was very exciting to be at the table with colleagues from environmental protection, from the transportation department, from parks, to work together on problems. We also collaborated very nicely with our state uh, uh, counterparts and uh, with the EPA. We, from the beginning, we were trying to make our work policy relevant. We had core funding for environmental health surveillance for the staff and supporting the data, the people, the systems that we needed to do our work. We served the health department, so we showed our value within the agency to, uh, to our commissioner and to our partners in our regulatory programs. And then we established very good partnerships with the academic community. One of the challenges we face, which I think is a challenge in environmental health generally, is that we're often discovering problems that don't have easy, uh, quick solutions, and so there can be resistance to releasing data about air pollution problems, for example. The agency pressures make the silos very durable and difficult to break down, especially when there's not strong political leadership to force that collaboration. And then we constantly experienced a lot of uncertainty about our core funding for environmental health surveillance, which came from the federal government, and that was always a challenge. Um, the, the sustainability planning can be a, a great opportunity for public health, but also a challenge because the definition of what sustainability is and what resilience is can kind of grow and become sort of everything, and so it becomes uh, kind of nothing. And then finally, uh, working with research uh, partners in the academic community, oftentimes the, age, the priorities for NIH, say, or NASA, uh, and the way they think of problems are different from the way that we thought of it as a city agency in terms of what's relevant, what's actionable. Uh, so in closing, I just want to thank uh, and acknowledge the great colleagues, the team that I worked with, and in front is my colleague, Dan Cass, who actually created the bureau that I inherited several years after he started there. Uh, so thank you very much. You didn't know if you went at the end of the day, you got an automatic standing ovation. <laughs> um, OK, great. Let's pull up. Thanks to the organizers. Um, I'm going to talk about energy transitions, and there, there are four things in here. Um, first, I was inspired by uh, Howie Frumpkin's uh, awesome alliterations, in particular that, that repetition reinforces. So I'm going to talk about the great acceleration, except we're going to look in a little bit of detail about um, the various energy transitions that have occurred in the past in the United States. And some of those were as the result of intentional policy, and some of those were accidental. And all we know for sure is that in the future there are going to be some other transitions. We don't know what they were go are going to be, but I think we can shape those. Um, second, I'll mention some of energy's impacts uh, upon health and the environment. Um, there have been some successes and there remain some challenges. Uh, third, I'll mention some tools that we have to try to steer these transitions in good directions. And then finally, uh, inspired by uh, Tom and Keisha's uh, health risk analyses frameworks, I'm gonna talk about uh, work that we're doing here at Hopkins under, actually under the uh, funding from Dan Costa's former program on air, climate, and energy, um, uh, where we're actually looking at future energy transitions and trying to project what will happen. OK, so the great acceleration. And what you see here is the total energy used for generating electricity, um, about half of it coal, a little bit of oil, um, a lot of it gas, uh, some nukes, and some 
uh, renewables, and this is for electricity production in the US, and you see that same exponential curve. And um, in the early history, coal was king, more than half a generation, but then, because of the accident of very cheap oil from the Middle East, we started using a lot more oil to generate electricity until the Arab oil embargo. Then, in part because of technology accidents, Admiral Rickover's nuclear-powered submarines, and in part because of federal policy, we invested a lot in nukes until a couple of other accidents. Three Mile Island, just north of here, for example. Then, uh, President Reagan deregulated the price of gas, and by a technological accident, in particular, GE's investment in, um, in uh, turbines for running jet airplanes in the 50s, somebody said, oh, maybe this is a good way to generate power, and it turns out that led to this dash for gas. Now, what's going to happen in the future? Um, if we are not intentional, the Department of Energy predicts that we'll still see coal, although I think actually we'll see some downturn if we don't do anything. Um, but we could be intentional, and um, this is the result, the projected result of uh, President Obama's clean power plan. We would see a lot more renewables, a lot more gas, and a lot less, less coal. So we can make some choices and steer this big ship slowly in a more sustainable direction. So let's look at some of the things that have happened as a result of these various energy transitions and environmental policy. This shows um, annual sulfur dioxide emissions in the US, which have been going down in nearly a straight line through now. Part of that is due to policy, in particular the uh, 1990 Clean Air Act amendments which capped things. And as a result, the electric utility's contribution to sulfur dioxide has almost completely disappeared. And some of it has, to, has been because of fracking and the displacement of coal by natural gas, which, as Brian Schwartz mentioned before, there have been a lot of bad things that have happened because of fracking, and this happens to be a good thing. Um, whoops, pardon me. Um, as we've seen, uh, atmospheric ambient levels of SO2 go down in lockstep, but not PM 2.5, which is what is causing people to, to die. Now, it's millions in India and, and China, only 100,000 or so in the US, but it's still a significant problem. And these levels remain persistently high despite SO2 going down. Uh, looking at uh, ozone, uh, we've been battling that by lowering NOx emissions, again from the Clean Air Act, and power plant emissions have nearly disappeared. However, um, uh, transportation emissions remain fairly stubbornly high. Um, but we see that the ambient concentrations of uh, NOx have been going down as a result. Ozone still kills about 10,000 people a year, and ozone concentrations are also remaining stubbornly high. They're coming down a bit, but not as quickly as NOx. That may be because our volatile organic compounds are not coming down as quickly, although the, the, actually the picture is much more complicated than that, and if, if Tad was still here, he would straighten us out on that. So we've made some progress, but there's still some problems. It's not just air, it's also water. The eutrophication, the enriching of the Chesapeake Bay and the consequent impacts on its ability to produce food um, are in large measure due to the enrichment from uh, nitrogen oxides and ammonia uh, that are airborne and fall into the watershed. And we're making a little bit progress, but not as much as we should. And finally, there's the, here's another elephant. This room is getting pretty crowded with elephants. And that's, of course, climate change. We need to, to really, uh, to, to arrest climate change in its tracks, we need to bring this down almost to zero. Obama's clean power plan would have maybe knocked off 10 or 20% of the emissions. But at least it was a start. Um, but what this is ignoring, uh, back to Brian's point again, is that 
there are a lot of other greenhouse gases other than carbon dioxide, in particular, fugitive methane emissions from uh, fracking operations are huge and underappreciated and have both health, media health consequences and long run climate consequences. So there are some challenges. What can we do about them in the future? So as uh, Jerry Taylor argued, we need a systemic price on carbon throughout the economy so that we're not paying $1,000 per ton over here to reduce carbon while we're ignoring opportunities over here that would cost $5 a ton or even nothing. We need a price everywhere, in transportation, in housing, and in electricity. Right now, we have prices in the Northeast United States and California on electricity-based carbon. These regions are too small because electricity markets are continental in scale. So if Maryland pushes down carbon, we just import more electricity from coal from Pennsylvania. Uh, however, these uh, uh, cap and trade systems have been effective in lowering sulfur dioxide and nitrogen oxides uh, from utilities. It, however, is not lowering them when they have the biggest health impacts. When we have ozone episodes during those very hot days, we're not cranking down these emissions in the way that we should. So that's what I mean by blunt. Um, regulators also have technology requirements. These are these command and control type measures that uh, Jerry criticized, but they are absolutely necessary to deal with local problems. And we have local problems, for example, for PM 2.5 from diesel emissions along the Amtrak uh, railroad. So uh, let regulators need to do something about that. If we have cheap energy, we're not going to reduce our use. So we need pricing reform for electricity so that people are incented to reduce their electricity use when electricity production is dirty and causing health impacts. One of the big changes in engineering over the, next, over the last 20 to 30 years has been adaptation to real-time conditions, sensing and controlling. So if we can anticipate that next week is a really bad week for air pollution, then we can do something about it by operating our power system differently. And we need to be able to do that from top to bottom, from consumption all the way to production. Subsidies are still an important tool. For example, the state of Maryland is going to get tens of millions of dollars from VW as part of the diesel settlement. And the question is, what should we use it for? For example, maybe we should replace diesel-powered school buses, which expose kids to fine particulates, to electric school buses. But is that a cost-effective way to use that money? Finally, land use and transport policies. I lived last year in Amsterdam. It's taken that town 500 years to be the, the human-centered, human-friendly city that it is. It's taken LA 50 or 100 years to become the car-friendly city that it is. It takes a long time to change things, and we need to be mindful of health impacts when we, in our transportation and land use policies. Uh, California, for example, there's a bill that would promote less energy intensive development near mass transit uh, locations, eight story apartment buildings. That is politically very controversial, but that's the sort of thing that may be needed. Okay, so bottom line, air pollution legislation has made a huge difference in the past in terms of reducing uh, mortality and morbidity, but there's a lot more to be done. We're looking, with the help of Don, uh, Dan Costa's former program, um, we're looking at things that can be done in the future to continue that progress using Tom and Keisha's health risk analysis framework. Uh, myself, Kirsten Kohler, are working on modeling energy transitions and air quality measurements. Folks at Yale and North Carolina State are doing the air quality simulations of public health impacts over the next three years. And we'll be looking at these energy transitions, more distributed, cleaner electricity generation, electric vehicles that use renewable energy, better and cleaner buildings, lower long-term natural gas prices, hopefully from a supply chain that isn't leaking methane all over the place. And finally, very important to Baltimore, modernized ports and marine shipping that doesn't rely on dirty diesel. So with that, I'll conclude. Thank you.
Great. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you. Uh, it's not every day I get a standing ovation, so I'm anticipating one. Um, <clears throat> I'm listed here at the University of North Carolina, and I was introduced as a retired EPA employee. I'm actually a recovering EPA employee. Uh, and for that reason, most you know, federal people who give presentations have this disclaimer on the bottom, any opinions expressed are uh, not those of the agency. Well, in this case, any opinions expressed should be the opinions of the agency. But in any case, what, what I... Uh, in my title, I, I inserted the word public health, and you'll see why uh, as, I, as I move through this uh, presentation. And uh, part of that is because I'm looking through a prism, uh, and the prism bends light a little bit, and I think we're sort of at the juncture where we need to bend the light as we look through the window a little bit, and hopefully I'll, I'll uh, clarify that as we move forward. So uh, quickly just to outline what I'm going to be talking about. Uh, uh, I'll just touch on from once we came. You heard a little bit from Ben Hobbs about this, and I won't dwell on that. I'm going to talk about the monitoring revolution, which we've heard uh, uh, mentioned a few times today, having to do with sensor, sensor technology, making sense of data. Um, I'll touch on what's left to be done. There's plenty still left to be done, and I think that's where this particular investment may be of greatest impact, and I certainly will uh, endorse the approaches of public health and systematic uh, approaches, uh, systems, systems. And at the end, um, I'll give some perspective and, uh, uh, and how I think this bending light uh, might be uh, put in place, although it may be a bit dangerous. Whoops. I'm one behind here. So there's a good news story, and we've seen that, that a little bit. In this particular uh, situation, you see here, uh, the reduction in pollutants on the bottom le uh, level, which are the ones that are direct emissions, ozone is one that's difficult to handle. Um, so, and this is right out of the EPA uh, uh, OAQPS website. You see up at the top, uh, contrary to the fake news that you have heard uh, quite a bit about, uh, the economic uh, improvements over this time period have been substantial. And that includes our love of the automobile and how many miles we've driven as well. And the impacts of some of the regulatory decisions on fuel economy, et cetera, et cetera, have all contributed to this. Uh, the problems that we will be facing, which we've had some uh, mention of, have to do with the production of greenhouse gases. CO2 is the one that's up here, uh, which grows pretty much in proportion to population. So it just shows you we're consuming just as much as we always have, although it's dipped down just a little bit. Um, and of course, uh, energy consumption goes right along hand in hand. That little dip over the last 10 years is primarily economic, but there have been some technological advances as well. So how is that translated into what's in the air? Uh, a look at the uh, dotted line, the national standards for PM 2.5 and PM 10. On average, and I emphasize on average, we're doing very well. The air is cleaner, you look out the window, uh, uh, Sir Patrick Lawther of uh, um, London Smog fame said, you know, the, uh, the public's interest in air pollution is directly proportional to what it can see. Uh, and people don't see much. So for that reason, there's not a whole lot of interest on the public side from the standpoint of air pollution. But we've made tremendous progress, so there's good reason for that. And we also see that uh, across the th 35 major cities in the U.S., the air quality index that's used to use, do some health assessments uh, has gone down. Emergency events in Los Angeles have gone down. So we've really, we really have a good news story to talk about. And this has been largely driven by a fairly sophisticated, uh, which is often called the gold standard of uh, monitoring networks. Uh, this is just for the NAAQS pollutants, but there's a component here for air toxics, and there's one associated with national parks, et cetera as well, but basically we're monitoring at great expense. Um, these uh, monitoring networks cost many tens of thousands of dollars uh, a year just to operate, and that's not including the capital investment. So uh, what's happening here? So over the last decade, we've seen a change. We've seen with the advances in technology, innovation, uh, new technologies coming along for air monitoring. It's been a, there's been a boom in sensor development. Uh, with increased response times, decrease in size, 
Um, and in fact, people uh, are beginning to use this information to try to, uh, these, these techniques, to actually apply them to their, to their own personal uh, situations. But there are many issues that still uh, exist with these sensors, and they have to do with accuracy, stability, data, translation, etc. So we do have a vision of where this is all going. You know, we start out with the gold standard of this network, okay, and at the same time, we're developing sensor technologies that we can put around facilities and we can do monitoring now a little bit uh, uh, more locally with this, these advancement technologies. We have a whole satellite technology that's advancing that's certainly going to come into play. We have the, the personal sensors and the local sensors that are going to be placed around. And maybe we can network all these through air quality modeling uh, capabilities. And lastly, bring them to your home. Bring them to your hand where you can actually get this information uh, and have it communicated in, in almost real time as to what's going on and potentially translate it into something useful. So that's the vision. I'm not quite sure that we're there yet. Uh, in fact, I know we're not there yet, but we're certainly headed in that way. At the same time, we have biometric uh, monitors that are being developed, conscious clothing, as it's called sometimes, uh, where you can monitor various cardiovascular events, temperature. Uh, there's been a, a joint uh, uh, venture by EPA and NHLBI to look at My Air, My Health, to try to look at the relationship between these two. There, of course, there are lots of personal information issues that ultimately have to be dealt with. But here, that's where we're going. That's, that's what's happening, whether we like it or not from a government perspective. So we're going to have lots of data. How do we handle this? Tremendous potential. What's there? Once you put the data out there, imaginative people are going to use this data and make good use of it. This enormous amounts of data are going to come from many, many people. We don't really have a standardized way of putting it there. It's, it's a hodgepodge. It's like going into my garage on a Saturday morning looking for a screwdriver. It's there. I don't know where it is. I don't know how it's expressed where I put it the last time. And that's where the data are being placed now in all of these different venues. Uh, the format varies. The location varies. Access is uncertain. Quality is uncertain. Not to mention just the quality of the instruments themselves. We all like to think we're smart. Whenever we say big data, it sounds like we know something. Uh, but we really don't. Big data is just big data. You know, when the epi data came out in the, uh, in the early 90s, Joel Schwartz, et cetera, developed the, the uh, um, time series analysis. It revolutionized how we looked at epidemiologic data. We need that kind of revolution in big data. Uh, and I often refer to, it's probably going to be three minutes, but that's OK. I often refer to Ewald Weibel in 1963, those of you who have worked in the lung. He reconstructed the entire lung framework that we use still today for deposition studies uh, by doing more, less well. So not so good data, if you put it together in a constructive way and you know what you're doing, you could probably make good value of that information. Making sense of the data. How are we going to translate this? Right now, we have the integrated uh, um, air assessments, the, the old criteria documents. All of that data is essentially useless right now for the kinds of data we're going to be producing out of this new technology. Uh, how are we going to translate that? We need to have to see how we can mine that data and begin to develop studies where we can actually produce data that we can marry the two together. And how do we use this data across the venue, and we've heard mentioned from the policymaker all the way to the public? Because people get information, and someone calls you up and said, my ozone monitor as I walked down the street said it was 0.3 ppm. What are you doing about this? Policy people need to know what to say and how to respond. So what lies ahead in air health? And this is something where I, I'd really like constructive criticism on this. Do we need to rethink, perhaps, how we approach things? On a rainy day, I actually read the Clean Air Act. Uh, <laughs> uh, and it occurred to me that the, word, the usage of the term public health perhaps was different, maybe not really consciously different, but is different from the way we're interpreting it. 
Public health is stated 64 times in the preamble of the Clean Air Act. And they keep talking about protection of public health. Yet all of the research we've been doing is health research. It's not public health research. We don't design the studies to get the most out of the public health application. And I'll explain what I mean about that in a minute, particularly as it relates to protection of, of sensitive groups. So we have this incredibly rigorous process. Uh, we have uh, health uh, data, we have atmospheric data, we go through this process, and I'll quickly go through this because this is what my intention is. You look at all of these things back and forth, information. What, the original Clean Air Act was, was passed. We had all five standards within six months. Reviews, decisions, et cetera. We can't get one through in 10 years for the most part. So where are we going to go? And the process continues until something emerges. But we still have problems. This is a study from uh, Neil Fan and his colleagues at the, uh, from the EPA. It shows that 5% of mortality is still attributable to air pollution. Where is this coming from? If we're below the standard, everything looks good. On average, it's great. So here we are. We're looking at this lake. We're lowering the lake. It's pristine. It's beautiful. New York City is nice and clear. We're looking across the city. But what is out there? Well, in fact, as you lower the lake, you find the old tires, you find the stumps. Those are the point sources around which many people live who are never accounted for, really, in this average that we want to deal with. How are we going to address that if, in fact, we're doing things? We have this city that has many local problems that we should be addressing directly. So are we getting the answers that we need for 21st century problems? Uh, do we stick to this process by tightening, 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 okay, with the sort of the reverse metaphor that all the boats go up and down at the same time, and we know that is not the case. So maybe we should be looking, rather than tightening the standard as the best approach, design our research to have public health decisions built in to their actual development of our of our studies, and then develop partnerships with the public. We've heard about citizen science, where the groundswell of information can help marry both the broader vision of health research with the public health application. And with that, I'd like to say that, in fact, maybe making a decision where you don't implement tightening of the standard quite so much, but invest in those communities that aren't even close may bring you a much bigger public health benefit in terms of cost, in terms of health, welfare, and provides more than this first world view of things where we should be looking at just averages. So with that, I thank you, and I'm sorry I ran over. Great. So if I could just ask the panelists to go ahead and come up to the front while this last talk is going on, we'll, we'll make sure we have the most time possible for uh, questions at the end. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Um, Leslie sends her regrets, and, and I am um, honored to be able to step in to provide my perspectives on transportation for the future. Just want to begin by reminding us about the essential components of, of transportation for a functioning society. We know that transportation provides access to goods and services, to jobs, schools. And there are many equity considerations, and I'll hit on some of them in, in my limited time today. I also view transportation as an environmental justice and social justice issue, and I'll also highlight that as well. And I hope by the end of, of this brief presentation, if you are not already convinced, you'll be convinced that there are significant impacts for public health. And, um, and I have a couple slides here from Leslie, and this is, this, is, um, this is one from her. Just to remind everybody of the role of transportation and its intersections with health, we see this slide showing the increase in obesity prevalence among adults in this country since 1960, um, along with vehicle miles traveled. So we're spending more and more time on the roads, driving more, and becoming more and more sedentary. And I would like to say that this is a problem, not only for obesity and other chronic conditions, but when we think about our streets that we're traveling on, the belief, or my belief, and of many public health advocates is that our streets should really be public assets. 
Many communities around this country have limited or no access to sidewalks, no bicycle lanes. Uh, when you walk down the street, you're not, seeing, uh, fat, you're not seeing fresh food, but you're seeing an abundance of fast food. There are establishments that engage in predatory lending. You see lots of signs and electrical wires. Again, these are all just equity issues because I would contend that in some of our more affluent country, uh, communities around the country, we don't see these same signs in our built environment. Here are some key public health considerations when we think about transportation. We know that there are implications for physical activity and active transport, so people who walk and bike for travel. We know that there are safety concerns noise, air pollution, mental health, well-being, and quality of life. And there are a number of key issues, and I'll go through a few briefly. I won't touch on all of the issues, but I'll highlight a few key issues that I think are important when we think about the future of transportation. The first is our aging in, uh, transportation infrastructure. The bridge on the bottom right is just from Friday. It's our pedestrian bridge collapse that occurred in Miami. Um, I was talking to a colleague yesterday who works with the NTSB who's down there investigating and just the tragedy that has led to um, a number of fatalities. And this is not new. We've, we've had many instances where we've had aging transportation infrastructure um, issues throughout this country. A second issue that I'd like to remind us to think about relates to rail tank car safety. Uh, there have been Concerns raised, there was a bill here in Maryland um, last year that, was, that would limit crude oil transport by rail. And this is a picture of a derailment that occurred up in Quebec several years ago that killed over 40 individuals and just devastated a whole community. So when we think about transportation, we're not just talking about cars on the roads, but I also want to remind you that we're thinking about uh, tra uh, excuse me, trains and thinking about uh, rail transport um, in terms of crude oil or other, other issues. Road safety, does anybody know what this number is? 37,461? It's the number of people who died last year from road traffic fatalities in this country. 2016 was the deadliest year on American roads in nearly a decade. And I would tell you when you look at the data, our federal government, our National Highway Transportation Safety Administration has said that 94% of serious crashes are due to errors people make behind the wheel. So we're talking about choices to drive intoxicated, risky driving, drowsy driving, a number of issues. And I want to remind all of us that road safety continues to be a preventable public health issue that we need to do better at. We also have risk to people walking, dangerous by design. This comes out every few years. Um, Smart Growth America published this report in January 2017 <laughs> that highlighted pedestrian fatality issues. So when we think about transportation and we're thinking about cars, we also have to think about individuals in their communities who are walking and who are at increased risk of being killed because of lack of sidewalks or living in communities that lack complete streets policies or other types of uh, interventions that would help create safer built environments. Another issue when we think of the tra future of transportation is driver impairment. We're starting to see more literature not only on drowsy driving but also on uh, driving related to marijuana use, particularly in states that have legalized marijuana. So there's some research coming out looking to see what do those risks mean for individuals? How do we have DUI checkpoints not only for alcohol but also for marijuana and other substances? I'd be remiss not to mention autonomous vehicles. Uh, there are a number of people here at Hopkins who are thinking about the ethical issues, the safety issues re uh, related to autonomous vehicles. And I will say that this is an issue where we don't see public health at the table and a real opportunity. And for those of you who are following what's happening with autonomous vehicles, you may know that on Sunday we had the first pedestrian struck by an autonomous vehicle who died, um, who since died unfortunately, and it was an Uber self-driving car being tested in Tempe, Arizona, and they've actually pulled all of their, their cars off the road today. And finally, an issue I want to mention are the growing inequities. I think when we look at transportation, we can think about racial equity issues, but also issues related to geographic uh, inequities between urban settings and rural settings, and also the fact that we know that individuals who live in under-resourced communities tend to lack access to adequate transportation infrastructure. We also know that there are differences in terms of cost to actually use public transportation, investments in public transportation, and how they are viewed by riders. And there are also a number of policies that exacerbate these inequities. 
I was uh, in Annapolis a couple of weeks ago for a bill that was in front of um, a committee I was testifying at related to removing the ability for car insurance companies to set rates based on your credit scores. You might think that, well, why would that be a problem? Well, the fact is, is that a number of individuals who need to get to work can't afford their health insurance, and we think about these systematic inequities that continue to exacerbate these differences that we're seeing. And this is just a quote here from Policy Link that reminds us that in order to have an equitable transportation system, we need investments that expand opportunity to the most individuals. And that includes investments in bus lanes, bus, uh, trains, roads, bike lanes, and sidewalks. So as we think about those future challenges or opportunities or issues to think about, I want to remind us that there are a number of ways that we can address the, these, these challenges. And one is cross-sectoral work, where we think about health public health engaging with transportation and transportation engaging with public health. So bi-directional partnerships that are authentic, that can identify common goals and win-wins in those partnerships and meaningful outcomes and evaluation. There are a number of efforts around the country that have these connections between transportation and public health. One is the Transportation Research Board. There's a Health and Transportation Subcommittee. We're seeing examples um, where, where Leslie's from, where the middle, with the Middle Tennessee Transportation and Health Study that's partnering with the CDC and USDOT to collect data on physical health, physical activity and health related to transportation. I'll just mention they have um, data from over 11,000 individuals where they've collected a number of health metrics um, and also transportation indicators. And I'll just say that when individuals were asked what their priority health issues were in relation to transportation and their concerns, the issues came up around poverty, unemployment, carless household, and aging issues. And this helped the MPO or the, um, the planning authority to prioritize greenways, sidewalks, and bikeways based on the data that came from this study. So I'll just end by saying another opportunity exists to really think about how to work together. This is a, a, a paper that some colleagues and I wrote. We are on a fairly new committee formed by TRB looking at the connection between arterials or our, our roads and public health. And we concluded that there are opportunities to do better in the future, where we can connect with transportation professionals, where we can apply engineering and, and design strategies that can help promote livability, safety, and air quality. And the fact is that many of the aims of public health and transportation overlap. So thank you very much. And uh, we'll turn to questions. Thank you. Great, so uh, thank you again to our panelists, and we've got just a couple minutes for questions, so we'll take a couple of questions before we turn to Megan. Okay. All right. Thank you all, is this on? It's great. Uh, thank you all so much for the presentations. Uh, it's been a really interesting and amazing day. Um, the question that I have, I think, spe specifically for our last two speakers, um, related to equity and the really localized impacts of, of air quality and transportation and the way that they intersect with each other, um, and specifically looking at with the energy sector and some of the policy proposals we've, we've been talking about earlier today, uh, looking at an issue like cap and trade in particular, um, which is, you know, in some ways there's debates around it, but it does seem to be effective in some ways at reducing those overall average uh, levels. Uh, but when it comes to the environmental justice frontline communities that are living next to point sources especially, um, this is just point sources from power plants, uh, we, we don't see that and there's been uh, a lot of opposition to cap and trade from environmental justice groups in California and elsewhere um, saying that it, it, it's a, a market-based mechanism for shifting the pollution around while, while keeping these hot spots um, and paying for offsets rather than reducing at the point source. Um, and that's, that's a challenge just for the, the large major point source emissions and then looking at transportation in areas like ports where we see these multimodal facilities, lots of different point sources, highways, uh, train lines, uh, freight coming in and out in many different ways, um, being these hotspots traditionally located in low-income communities of color, uh, disadvantaged in many different ways, um, and what kinds of public health solutions can we address that doesn't look at just average improvements, but really focusing the, uh, the improvements in the areas that need it most. Go ahead. Go ahead. You go for some. Oh, no, no problem. I, I was just going to say, in some ways, uh, uh, they're connected and they're disconnected. 
uh, we've ign essentially ignored by intent or not the point source issue and the dis you know the disadvantaged groups by for whatever risk factor they have for for so long. The thing is is what climate does is essentially it elevates the heat, pardon the the, the pun, to to the whole system. So that needs to be addressed on an average basis because it's everywhere. It, but it, we all know that from a number of studies that climate change is particularly on the coastal side is going to have the biggest impact on communities of uh, color and disadvantage for other reasons. So they need to be thought together, but in some ways they're separate and we can do something about the point source issues now. We don't have to wait for climate. We don't have to do these other things. The question is, is do we have the will to do it? Yeah. Uh, so a cap and trade is really good for regional issues and global issues. Um, furthermore, Title IV of the Clean Air Act, uh, which uh, capped SO2 emissions, lowered emissions everywhere. Nowhere did emissions go up. So there wasn't a hot spot issue in which total emissions go down, but somewhere it popped up. But local problems, health problems, that's why we have ambient air that's standards. That's why we have the National Air Ambient Air Quality Standards. And if we have violate, which are supposed to be, the primary standards are supposed to be health-based. If those are violated, we need, we need to deal with those, and states, that's why the states do their state implementation plans. So cap and trade does not make those problems worse, and that's why we give regulators multiple tools so we take care both of local health problems and the regional and global problems that we need to deal with. Yeah, I think um, based on uh, studying the problem in New York City and also looking globally, there's, in addition to point sources, actually the uh, concentration and the distribution of these distributed sources like household energy. Uh, you, you know, in even in buildings in New York City, the efficiency of operation of heating plants is not going to be at the level it is for a coal-fired power plant, for example. The process control is not there. And then if you look globally, where you have a large proportion of the population in Sub-Saharan Africa, in South and East Asia, using solid fuels, biomass, charcoal, dung, coal, uh, it turns out they have an outsized influence on ambient air quality, and they're impacting disadvantaged communities primarily. Uh, in New York, we see truck traffic um, and bus traffic, heavy-duty diesel traffic, not a point source, but a concentration of of on-road mobile sources impacting disadvantaged communities. They're much harder to deal with. You know, we would, uh, in our data suggested that something like a low emission zone in New York City would be a good strategy, but there's tremendous like jurisdictional problems uh, for doing that in, in the US. So um, it's often easier to look at a facility and say that must be the problem but oftentimes the problem are these much more difficult to manage distributed sources, household energy, uh, and uh, concentrations of on-road mobile pollution in urban uh, neighborhoods. And I'll just add one general comment in terms of public health. And I think that there's a real opportunity for public health to continue to work closely with communities. And I mean communities with neighborhoods and, and individuals who are directly impacted by decisions. And I think there's a, a great, um, we have great tools around advocacy and, and organizing. Um, I mean, here at the School of Public Health, there's a course on organizing, and you don't really see that at many schools of public health. And I think that there's great um, opportunities to really um, engage with community organizers around these important issues. Um, and I think that that is just necessary for a number of these um, environmental justice issues. So it looks like we're out of time for this session, believe it or not. One question and we're done. Um, but let's uh, thank all of our panelists for their contributions. Great. So thanks again to this panel and to all of you for, for sticking with it here through the day. Um, just a few reminders before uh, Megan shares some closing thoughts. Um, 
hopefully you still have somewhere nearby that blue folder that you got when you came in. And on the right-hand side of that folder is an evaluation form. So in keeping with the discussions about data collection and learning from data, uh, we'd appreciate you sharing um, your thoughts on how the day went, how we could do this better in the future. Um, and you can leave that on your table or sh uh, deliver it to that back table um, when you've completed it. So it's something to work on. And then uh, just a reminder that if you haven't had your parking validation uh, completed, you can see the folks at the back table to help you out with that before you have to leave. Um, but there is still a, a number of great things coming up uh, before the day is over. So 4.30, there'll be a reception downstairs in the gallery. And we'll be back in this room at 5.30 for dinner um, and remarks from Pat. Uh, so Megan, go right ahead. So um, have you guys ever had, I, I, this is my first time having this dream. The dream before something that you're really nervous about and you show up, and you might not be fully ready for it. So I'll just say, at least I have all my clothes on. <laughs> um, but I really, I, I, I want to say, I'm, I need to pull up my, um, my remarks. But um, I do think that the one piece of clothing I'm willing to throw down is the gauntlet today. Um, I'm really excited. I want to actually tell a story to start off. Um, it's it's a word document. Um, it, and for those of you who know the story, I apologize. But I've been told by people who've heard the story that I need to keep telling the story. So you, I can give you names of people to blame if you've heard this more than once. Um, it was 2009. I had just had my first and only child. Um, and I was traveling to my very first meeting away from her for, you know, a couple days. And I don't know, maybe it was the hormones, but for whatever reason, there was a woman in the back of the room and she had a baby. And I kept staring at her. She probably thought I was really creepy. Um, but I was like, oh, there's a woman with a baby at an environmental health conference. This was in CD, at CDC, um, the 2009 National Environmental Health Conference. And um, do you guys need my help? OK, sorry. Um, and at the very end of this discussion, the woman stood up, and she started talking. And so I really paid attention. I was like, oh, OK. I, w I wonder who this woman is. And she said she had driven across five states to get to this meeting. She said, in her state, it was legal to burn pesticides. But across a border that she lived near, in another state, it was illegal. And so every night, trucks would cross over the state line and head to an incinerator. And every morning, the, her neighborhood would wake up, and they would have this thin ash all over everything in the neighborhood. She said she didn't really notice it until she had a baby. And once she had the baby, she started wondering what's in this ash. And um, so she one day happened to see a police officer driving through the neighborhood. And she stopped him. And she's like, how do I find out what's in this ash? He was like, I don't know. Why don't you call the Department of Natural Resources? So she went inside, she called the DNR. And DNR said, oh, we, we can't help you with that. Why don't you call the State Department of Environmental Protection? And the State Department of Environmental Protection said, no, 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 that's not our jurisdiction. That's the Department of Health. So she called the Department of Health. And the Department of Health said, uh, you know, that's not really us. Why don't you call ATSDR? And ATSDR said, um, yeah, there's this whole process that you have to go through, you know, to, to get us to do a community consultation. And anyway, she, when she Googled ATSDR, she happened to see this meeting was coming up. And she thought, I am not getting any answers. So she drove across five state lines with her baby and other people in her community. And I think it was the hormones. But I started crying. I didn't, I actually didn't, the tears didn't drop down. They were still in my eyes. Um, and then a friend of mine, Tracy Coley, and looked at me and she said, are you crying? And then they started dripping down. I was just devastated. I just, 
you know, I got into environmental health because I wanted to help people. And I know everybody who works in our field got into it for similar reasons. We want to make the world a better place. And this, we had failed this woman, completely failed her. And I didn't know what to do about it. I worked at the Association of Public Health Laboratories, the director of environmental health. What, how could I help this woman? So why am I telling you this story? Um, well, I'm hoping that somebody's going to pull up the rest of my talking points, because so far I'm just flying by the seat of my pants. Um, <laughs> my laptop is right here. I drafted them all day long. They're based on everything you've been talking about. They're right on here. It's a Word document. <laughs> So the reason I'm, talking, I'm telling you this story is because I'm so excited to be here. Almost 10 years later, it was 2009. It's almost 10 years later, and we're talking about transforming the field of environmental health. And I'm hoping we can do it in a way that we can address these failures of our system. That we can take a look, thank you so much. Um, that we can take a look at the system using tools like we saw presented today. You know, I, our field often complains. We say, oh, nobody understands our work. Nobody knows what environmental health means, and nobody values what we do. But we don't really engage the public in our work. A lot of times, we'll invite them to the table only after we've had several meetings and we already have a plan, or we already know what needs to be done. And I think that's what Cliff was talking about earlier, and we've heard a lot today. And the other thing I think we do is we often say, we need a seat at the planning table, or we need to present at the transportation hearing. But what are we doing to get there? We can't just complain. It's time to really take action and to do something, and so that's why I'm really excited about this opportunity. We hope that today uh, we've built some bridges between environmental health leaders and people doing environmental health. Even if you don't think of yourself as somebody doing environmental health, some of the people we invited said to us, well, I'll come, but I don't work in environmental health. And we did that very purposefully. And we hope that, um, like I said, that we have built some bridges here today. And as Tom mentioned at the start of the day, we have these wicked problems. But I think with new partnerships, with expanded engagement and a holistic systems approach, evidence-based approach to designing communities, to environmental health, I think we can do this. And so um, this is not the end. A small group of us are going to meet tomorrow. Um, and based on these conversations, we're going to come up with some actions. We want to be action-oriented. We want to actually change things, not just sit here in a room and waste your time and talk about it. Um, and so we're going to plot a path forward. And if you're coming tomorrow, don't forget your visitor pass. And tomorrow, we're going to be in E9519. So while we were talking today, I jotted down a couple of potential priority areas. Um, there were seven. And actually, I didn't really have time to incorporate the summary that I did, so that also will add to this. But the seven, one of the first of the seven potential priorities I wrote down were utilizing existing and also designing new systems frameworks to model complex relationships in environmental health. So these frameworks can help in decision making um, when it comes to transportation, energy, and planning. For example, like a budgeting model. It might show that an investment in public transit would improve health at a lower cost than doing an in-home air quality monitoring program. So how do we decide where to spend our resources? Something that can model that. Um, some of the obstacles are probably scaling these models, but also validating the results. Um, and getting models that will actually be useful, that people that won't sit on a shelf, that people will actually use. The second priority area is reaching beyond our comfort zone. So I think in, in our field, we represent a relatively small, tight-knit community. And we all go to the same meetings, and we all talk the same language, and we all basically agree 
that our issues are so underappreciated. And I think we need to start to stretch beyond that comfort zone and we need to go to planning hearings and transportation meetings and energy conferences. And instead of saying other fields need to come to us, we need to go to them and we need to learn their language and their vocabulary. And I think the idea of incentivizing this, this outreach, building it into job descriptions um, and into budgets, it might help ensure that it doesn't land at the bottom of our to-do list, because that's what, that's what happens. We all have our job descriptions, right? And I think that case studies can, can look at this, can prove or disprove the utility of such an approach. The third potential priority that I wrote down was engaging communities um, concerned about environmental health, and this goes back to my story. And I think we, we have to recognize, you know, I, I teach a, a MOOC, a massive open online course on chemicals and health, and 40,000 people have enrolled in this course. Targets people with high school um, education or maybe college education but not science or math background. 40,000 people get really riled up when they learn about chemicals and health. And there is this strong desire out there in the public to drive our field. They're worried about it. They're willing to contribute to it. They want to do something. And how do we tap into that? How do we engage these communities in meaningful ways and understand what their questions are, not what we think their questions should be? I'll never forget when I left here, I went and did a training with the National Association of County and City Health Officials on PACH, the Protocol for Assessing Community Engagement in Environmental Health. And I remember thinking, oh, I know what this community is going to be worried about. They're going to be worried about asthma and air pollution and lead poisoning and water. And my mouth was on the floor because they were worried about walking outside in their neighborhood and lighting at night and graffiti. And I was thinking to myself, well, that's not environmental health. That's not what I was taught. But it is environmental health. And I think we have to challenge ourselves in the old model of environmental health and transform the way that we think about environmental health. So that was only the third priority, and I'm getting the five-minute sign. Um, so engaging communities is, is one of them. And we have to, you know, maybe we could do things like a tracking system for how community groups or individuals access our governmental system, like this woman who got bounced around from agency to agency, we should have ways of tracking her question through the system, or maybe an ombudsman to help her navigate the system. And we need to study, we need to collect data before and after implementing programs like that to see if they actually do work. Of course, education, this is Hopkins, so we think about how do we educate the future leaders. And we need to not only tell them about historical injustice, um, but we also need to teach them how to engage communities in ways uh, that the communities will really feel valued um, and be valued early on in the process. And if we expect citizens to be citizen scientists, we need to give those citizens the tools to understand the science in ways that, that is accessible to them. And also if we want the business community um, to take a leadership role when it comes to environmental health, we have to show them not just the science, but we have to talk their language. We have to talk about economics and return on investment and cost benefit. And we need to train the next generation of environmental health leaders not only in economics, but in modeling, systems thinking, community engagement, and communications. And communications was a big theme today. And I think we have to ask ourselves, why don't communities value our work? Why don't people believe our science when we talk about climate change? I think Jerry really got at that today. Are we communicating in ways that show that we understand our audience, or do we assume that they share the same values that we share, or that we have? Are we showing that we hear communities, that we understand their concerns? Do we need to lay out more facts, or do we need to appeal to emotions? The last election really spoke to me about that. Um, facts didn't seem as important as I, as a scientist, might like them to be. And number six on my priority list is an honest assessment. So I just um, finished up as chair of APHA's environment section, the American Public Health Association for your non-public healthers. 
And my biggest disappointment was not being able to have the time to take a step back and look at the environmental health system. If you ask me, it's, it's beyond time. Um, stories like the one that I just told you and like the one that Michelle Roberts uh, referenced, we're failing in some serious ways and I think we need to reinvent ourselves. We need to go back to our roots, to the communities where Jon Snow and Alice Hamilton worked. We need to put the public back in public health. And of course, being Hopkins, research. Anything we have to do needs to be evidence-based and to be studied, to find out what really works, not just what we think works because it makes sense, but to actually show that it does work. And that's really a great way to influence uh, policy and legislation, as Crissini can attest to from his time in North Carolina. And as we implement new frameworks or engage new partners or change the way that we educate, we need to measure the impact of these efforts. And more importantly, as we design or redesign communities across the country, we need to track outcomes. So for example, does decreasing use of cars actually lead to reduced air pollution and lower asthma or obesity rates? So, all right, whether you came to this meeting with a clear understanding of what environmental health was, or whether you wondered why the heck you got invited, I hope that you're leaving with some new ideas um, about the field and how it can expand to be more holistic and to include more partners. This is just the beginning of the conversation, like I mentioned. We will be in touch with all of you. We hope that you're gonna remain engaged, that you'll send us potential fellows to, to come and uh, study here, like Julian and Kelly. Um, and we plan to publish a paper based on the conversations we're having today and these topics. And we plan to incorporate your feedback into our work. So whether it's here at Hopkins or whether it's on the National Academies um, project that Tom is leading or whether it's through my work with the American Public Health Association. I wanna end on a hopeful note. Um, I'm really lucky in my job uh, because I get to see the future of environmental health every day. I work with students from the high school level uh, to undergraduates to graduate students and this next generation is really smart. And I think they get systems issues better than I do. And they ask really thoughtful, tough questions. So I'm really excited about the future. I think as children, we all dream about making the world a healthier place. And I'm hoping this is an opportunity to engage the nation in this struggle. Um, one community, one project, and one study at a time. So thank you all for being here. Um, that's all that I have to say. I don't know if you want to add anything or, okay, great, thank you.